Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, We'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, In addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. The beat in that bumper video is way cooler than I am, so thank you, Lauren, for making me feel cooler. But either way, it's great to be here with all of you this morning. We're going to jump right into the Word of God. Would you stand with me here this morning? We believe some things about the Word of God. If we could put that up on the screen, you guys could say that with me here today. The Word of God is fully inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's written without error, and it's the authority in our life. Amen? Amen. 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 There's like three amens. Amen? Amen. 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 So we are in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 today. So let's read together and then we'll unpack it here this morning. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy and old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, you have not discriminated, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor, and is is it not the rich exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourselves, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. I thank you for your people gathered here today. God, we open up our hearts to your word. Holy Spirit, would you have your way in our hearts here in this place here today, God? Lord, show us the ways that we're to go. Encourage us in the things that we're getting right in life. Convict us in the ways that we need to be corrected, God. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would do a work. May these words be your words and not my words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So a few things here this morning. We're going to talk about favoritism, and then we're going to talk about the opposite uh, or the contrary part of that. The remedy for that is to love your neighbors yourself. And so in this analogy, if we kind of put it into the context of today of, of, well, if someone came into Christ Community Church, I fully and wholly believe all of the people that I know who go here, if someone came in and they were looking a certain way and smelling a certain way and kind of down on their luck that, that, our, or that all of us would embrace that person. I believe that about Christ Community Church. Do you guys believe that yeah. about Christ Community Church? I just know our church is that way. In fact, I, I think you might step past someone who might be uh, all cleaned up and shiny and squeaky clean to go see that person who actually looks a little down and out. And I love that about us here at Christ Community Church. So praise God for that. And so with that, though, it's easy to read this passage because it uses an illustration about the meeting that's happening, or church is really what it's referencing, and say, oh, well, I'm good. I'm, I'm guilt-free on that one. I can move on. I don't have a whole lot to learn or to apply in this passage because we got this one as a church. We don't do that, right? The truth, though, is, is that he's only using the meeting as an example of what it, our heart attitude is. In fact, this can be applied and should be applied to all areas of our life of not showing favoritism. And so at one level or another, all of us are guilty actually of favoritism. And today we'll talk a little bit about social media and what social media does to show us 
our decrepit and sinful ways in our life, it's really a big giant mirror. And so we're not going to have a big message just about social media. I believe actually social media is neutral. All it does is give a more of a platform for both good and evil, depending on how you want to use it. But social media does not cause our sins of comparison and judgment. It merely amplifies our sinful nature. And so when we look at what social media does and, and the effect it has on us, yes, too much time on it is not good uh, for any of us, but at the same time, it's really not the cause of sin, it just amplifies the sin that's already there. So whether or not you're on social media uh, is of no real difference if you're going to apply this passage to your life, because all it does is it, it shows us, it's a glimpse into the human heart. And so I want to take a look at that word favoritism for a moment. I want us to find each of us, our place in our passage today. Where does it fit into the context of my life? Where are the areas that maybe I'm showing some favoritism towards others or maybe prejudice or bias, which would still fall into that category? Uh, and so in the, in the original Greek language, that word favoritism was a really interesting one. We don't look at the original languages that much here, but I thought it was really important to what we're talking about here today. In the original Greek language of the New Testament, the word translates as, that's translated from favoritism, good luck saying this one, prosopolempsia. All right, anyone else want to give that a shot? All right, we're moving on. Uh, maybe at home. You guys say it in your living room. I'm sure you're crushing it, especially because we can't hear you, uh, which literally means to receive according to the face. This term is derived from two words, uh, prospon, meaning face, and lambano, meaning to receive. Essentially, it refers to the act of making judgments or showing special treatment based on an outward appearance rather than merit or character. And so as we start diving in here today, we're going to kind of look at the problem and then we're going to look at the remedy, praise God, for that. But the truth is, if we're going to be super honest, any honest people in the room here this morning, you want to be honest about yourself? Okay, anybody want to be honest about the person sitting beside you but not yourself here today? It's way easier, right? Yeah, John and Mike, you guys can be honest about each other, right? That's love, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We'd love to love to love to love to think that we're not like everybody else that we come across in the world. We're not like that person at Walmart or at the grocery store, that coworker, or that family member. We're not like those other people. Uh, we're different. We want to believe that. But the truth is, is that cult, the culture we are in shapes what we value and emulate. This is something we have to wrestle with. You see, James was writing to the churches scattered all over as we've been in this series but there was a mixed community there, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, people who were dignitaries and those who had no, no stock to anything in life and, and were down and out, and they were all mixed together, the body of believers, the way it should be, but they were still bringing the cultural influences into those situations. In fact, in that time, it was very much a caste society. And what it meant was if you had some sort of royal name or a prestigious name of a family that moved you up kind of the pecking order of society, if you were wealthy, if you were in the trades, if you did something that was of high regard, it would move you up. And then your generations of families would also kind of be born into that and it was really hard to move out of one caste, if you will, one level of society into another. There's still very much, in many countries, caste societies that go on. Here we do it a little quieter, uh, but we rate people uh, the way they did then. And what he was saying is, is that don't just look at these people who are rich. And by the way, I want to remind you, poor people in the room, who are, who, this is what James is saying to the church, you're showing favoritism to these wealthy people. Those are the same wealthy people who are treating you like a loan shark. They're charging you 50%, 100% interest on the money that is going to be impossible to pay back, and then they're dragging you into court. They're the same ones that in the public square are, are, are speaking against the name of Jesus, yet when they come into this meeting, you're treating them like they were him or Jesus himself and disregarding the other poor. What he's not saying, though, is, is to kick them out. That's not what he said, is it? is it? He didn't say, hey, this meeting's just for people who have been marginalized or mistreated. The, the meeting place, the church, is still for everyone, but everyone is to be treated 
the same. And so that's what we're talking about then. But how do we show favoritism in today's culture? And this is a big question because we need to reflect on our own heart. What does this look like? And so we're going to do some reflecting here this morning before we get to the remedy. But the first part is, is that our culture very much looks at appearances, but we need to know that God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart, but we look at appearances, don't we? Just look around. I mean, if we were all still wearing clothes that were only in style in 1940, we'd stand out a little bit in the room, don't we? We look at, yeah, exactly. You know, I got my dad outfit on today. I got my new balances and my jeans. I know you're out there judging me because I get comments like, hey, I like that shirt today. Hey, you look like you lost a little weight. Whatever the case may be, that's what I get. You judge or you look like you gained a little weight. You don't say that, thank God. Thank you. But we do judge based on appearances. But it goes beyond that because it's also face value. It's not just how someone's dressed or how tall they are or short they are or what gender they are, any of those kind of things. It's those things, but it's also what kind of house they live in, what neighborhood they live in, where they're from when they grew up, what they do for a living, what kind of car they drive, their personality. Uh, What kind of person are they? How do they talk? How do they act? How do they treat other people? That's still an outward appearance. It's what they do that we can see and hear and feel, right? Right? And so when we consider those things, we have to understand that. And then you go to, we judge people based on talents. Uh, maybe they can play an instrument really well, or they paint really well, or they're a great carpenter, or you know, maybe you're getting into like who's the best basketball player of all time. Is it Michael Jordan, or is it LeBron James? Now, I'm a Michael Jordan guy. Anybody Michael Jordan, best player of all time? Any LeBron James people in the room? You don't want to raise your hand now. Okay. We'll argue later. My argument is, is, is uh, Jordan didn't have to swap 100 teams and he made everyone on his team better. Anyways, that's all good. We're going to move along. But my point, though, is, is that we do base a lot on appearances. But this is what Jesus, what God says in 1 Samuel, in the choosing of David to be the king of Israel, he says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, if we're really going to love our neighbors ourselves, and we'll get into who our neighbor is in a minute, we've got to have the heart that God has for people. We've got to look past the exterior, whatever's going on in life. We've got to look past what they look like, act like, think like, smell like, talk like. We've got to look past all of that because God sees all of that too. We need to look them right in, the, right in the dead of their eyes, into their soul and into their heart and love them the way God loves them. And that's what God's calling us to do. The next one is this, is, is that our culture is focused on praising ourselves. God wants us to praise and honor others. Look, if social media doesn't show us our self-centeredness, I don't know what else does. Look, the whole system is set up for our own self-proclamation, is it not? likes, loves, think about it. How many, uh, you know, everything is about, the, is about what selfies we can take. We put our best self forward. No one's putting a, a photo of their dirty dishes in their sink on social media, are they? You know, I put on sometimes when I make things out of wood because I just, you know, I like that we can interact and see what each other are doing. I love that. We want to celebrate what other people are doing, but I don't put all the ones I make mistakes on. And then when I take a photo of the woodwork and I do, I make sure the angle and the lighting is right so you see the best quality and I don't show you the drips and the chips and all the stuff so from a distance, it looks really good. We used to have this saying in the car business, many of you know I was in the used car business for years, we used to have this saying about cars, it looks good from far, but it's far from good. (laughs) That's social media, is it not? But look, it just highlights and feeds the fact that we're self-centered, self-praising, self-proclaiming people. Now, some of us have this woe-is-me mentality. By the way, that's just reverse pride. It's the same as being prideful about yourself. But either way, if you're, if you're proclamating the misery you live in or proclamating how wonderful life is and how great you are at something and things, you're praising yourself when God tells us to praise him and to put no other gods before him. And when our social media feed or our life is all about what we do and what we can say and all, the, all those things that are great about me, 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 we've actually put ourselves in that first commandment and we've praised ourselves above God. 
We've also generally overlooked the people around us that need encouragement and honor and praise. And so Jesus, I got a few verses I'm going to rip off for you here, rattle off for you. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth. I mm. think that should be read again. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth. How much of our posts and conversation are about us and not about others? This says in, in the proverb, the lips of strangers, let them notice. An outsider, someone looking in, does your life proclaim the right things? Or does someone say, wow, that person has a lot, does a lot, knows a lot, all those kind of things. Or does that person say, wow, that person really loves a lot. Because what this passage says is, is that we're to love our neighbors ourselves, right? And so does the praise that we get from outsiders draw us back, show to the world that we love a lot. The next one's Romans 12, 10. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another showing honor. Look, honor has its place. We should honor and encourage. There's another verse, but I was trying to limit how many references I had here today, but it says if uh, the person who encourages will themselves be encouraged is what the NLT says, but it says he who refreshes others, he himself will be refreshed. We often are short and unfulfilled in our life. We need encouragement, but then we have to ask ourselves how much have we encouraged other people? A lot of days when I'm, when I'm down and think, oh, I could really use some encouragement, I've found the days I get it right because I don't get it right every day. You guys know that, but the days we get it right by picking up the phone and thinking of a few other people that need encouragement and calling and encouraging others, I myself receive encouragement back. But we live in this deficit because we spend all of this time honoring ourselves rather than honoring God. We spend all of this time praising ourselves as opposed to praising God. We spend all this time trying to give us some own self-care and self-encouragement, and we, don't, we, we neglect actually encouraging and praising others. And that's what these verses are talking about, but that's how we show favoritism, even not so much towards outsiders or towards other people that we look at. We'll get to that in a minute. But the first person we show the most favoritism to, the first person that we treat better than others, is ourselves. I'm going to take a risk here. Anybody guilty of what I'm talking about right now? I mean, we love ourselves above anybody else in the world. Come on. If we're going to be honest, we, we, we love ourselves first. It's the core of our pride. The next one is this Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God Sacrifice, sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for this with such sacrifices God is pleased. Look, we need to know something, that we can, we can talk about who's the best basketball player of all times. I love having that argument. I like it to be heated, actually. It's really good. It's fun. But we're not going to break relationships over it, Steve. You just have to admit at some point you're wrong. It ain't LeBron, bro. <laughs> But I'm not praising and worshiping the guy. I'm just talking about how good he is at basketball. But we fall into this thing where we're following others and we're emulating people and thinking, oh, I want to be that guy. I want to be that real estate tycoon. I want to be retired at 35. I see all that ship sailed for me a long time ago uh, now that I'm well past 35. We see all of these things that we emulate and that we try and follow in our culture. And it's just not what God wants us to follow. Maybe God is going to allow you to be great at something. Maybe he's going to allow you to have some wealth in life or whatever it is that you're after. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> all the praise and the glory goes to God. Amen? Because he's the one that gave you the ability to do what you do and be who you are. And most importantly, he allowed you to be called his son or daughter because of what his son did on the cross for you. And we're to outdo one another showing honor. Every time you look to honor yourself, if we pause and think, God, help me to praise you and honor others, the more we do that, the more habit will be in that. I'm not the best encourager. It's not my natural default setting. I've prayed and I've tried to be intentional about encouraging, but you know what it is? The more I'm intentional about trying to encourage other people, the more I do it normally. The more I do it regularly, just out of kind of normal conversation. I, I walk away from conversations going, did I share a word of encouragement with that person? Did I, did I reciprocate encouragement? 
to that person. And it's something to be thinking about, have I loved my neighbor as myself? Last one is this, before we dive into the remedy. Our culture's love is based on appearance and performance. It's similar to the appearance one, but I'm going somewhere with this. But God calls us to love deeply from the heart. 1 Peter 1.22, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another. Someone say what that word says. Deeply from the heart. This part comes back to that deep, sincere love. It, it transcends all the things that are external. It transcends all the things that God uh, w- w- would, would say uh, are wrong even, the sin in our life. We're overcoming those things by loving each other deeply from the heart. Another passage says that love overcomes or covers over a multitude of sins, and it's, it's true. It doesn't excuse them. It doesn't tolerate them. It speaks truth to them, but it also overcomes them because love is, is there to say, hey, I want to I really enter in to that situation. But think about the performance-based thing for a moment. You know, that's that kind of I'll love you if you love me back kind of thing. And when we think about that, our relationships are very much quid pro quo. We're on a, well, what have you done for me lately kind of economy in most of our relationships. It's like that in our workplace. It's often like that in our marriages. It could be like that with our children. We, we show them affection and love based on how good they do, but when they don't do well in school or they misbehave, typically we show them less love because we don't feel it. But love is way more than a feeling. It's an action. It's something that we choose to do even in the midst of us not feeling like that's what we want to do right now. That's the difference between love and feeling. And so when we consider that, we have to consider what am I basing how I view other people? What am I basing my love for other people on? Whether it be a stranger, Scripture tells us even that we're to love our enemies. We don't have time to go there today, but if you want the reference, it's Matthew 5, 44, part of the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, James is a practical application of the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to read the Sermon on the Mount while reading James, it's Matthew chapter 5 through eight, I think, if I get it right. But either way, it's, it, read till you find it. That's my favorite thing to say. So, but it's, it's there. But either way, it's a parallel, the book of James, uh, to the Sermon on the Mount, and it puts some practical application on that. But Matthew 5, says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's a little deeper kind of love, isn't it? That's a real deeper kind of, of favor that God wants us to show. You see, God's favor eliminates favoritism. We're going to talk a little bit here today about what God's favor looks like, and even uh, with baptism coming up here in a few moments, uh, we think about God's favor. He doesn't show favoritism to anybody. In fact, He allows us all to enjoy His favor if we choose to accept Him. James 2.8 says, If you really kept the royal law... Uh, found in scripture love your neighbors yourself you are doing right and we'll go on to the next verse Uh, we'll look at it again this is again a a reference from the sermon on the mount he says so in everything do to others what would you have what you would do uh, what you would have them do to you thank you very much Uh, for this sums up the law and the prophet let's think about this for a minute because a lot of times we're more on the side of do to others as they've done to us Anybody live by that standard? I won't have you raise your hand, but maybe you used to. It should, it's more of a a tit-for-tat kind of situation. Oh, you punch me, I'm going to punch you back. You do good for me, I'm going to do good for you. You invite me over to dinner, I'm going to invite you over to dinner. You pay the bill this time, I pay the bill next time. There's there's nothing wrong with kind of trading off in some of that, but what we end up doing in a lot of cases when we think about loving other people, we're actually working on like a relational barter system. And it's just not okay. And and you see, we need to then treat others the way that that we want them to treat us. We need to do to others the way that we would want them to do to us, regardless if they reciprocate, though. You see, there's no saying, love others as you would want them to love you if they're nice. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, love others the way that you'd want them to love you if you already are feeling the love from them. 
What it's saying is, is that we're to step out as followers of Christ Jesus who are in God's love, full of God's love, under God's grace, His favor, and show that favor to the world around us as His messengers, as His ambassadors of the peace that we walk in with Christ Jesus. Regardless of what's coming at us, He tells us to love our neighbors the way that we would like to be loved. Think about yourself in the, just the worst moment of your life. Just you're having a bad day. You're having a bad hair day. You're having a bad traffic day. The car's broken. The dog's barking. There's no food in the fridge. Whatever it is that sets you off, whatever it is that sets you off, maybe you only got one like on your post and it's been up for 24 hours and you're like, does nobody like me? Am I speaking to the right? Okay. Whatever sets you off, I want you to think about that though. Maybe you've got anger issues and you've just been totally overwhelmed with anger issues and you're coming at somebody. You still need to be loved in that moment though, don't you? How do you want to be loved in your worst moment? Even when you don't really deserve to be loved because you're, not, you're kind of acting a fool and you're not doing what's right and maybe even you're acting out towards someone but if that, you're on the other side of that, how would you want to be loved by that person? How would you want to be handled by that person? That's what Scripture is asking us. What it takes is self-sacrifice. To love our neighbor the way that God wants us to love our neighbor is self-sacrifice. So maybe you're asking the question, who's our neighbor? Your neighbor is any person who you come into contact with in life. Jesus answers that question to the Pharisees, and he gives the the parable of the the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, and the person who was left on the side of the road. And that's just a parable, but it's someone who we just happened upon, who we helped. We may happen upon somebody. Our neighbor could be our spouse. It could be our child. It could be the person, our roommate. At college, it could be anybody, but our our neighbors, anyone who we come into contact with, that's a big list when you start thinking about it, isn't it? But God has called us to not judge them based on appearances, not to show favoritism or lack thereof based on appearances. He's called us to love them the way that we would want them to love us. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? So I got a few questions for you, and then we're going to talk about the grace that we walk in, and how to distribute that to others. Faith in Action is the series title. And so question one is, what are the values, uh, are the values in each area of your life, work, family, and friendships based on outward appearances and performances? That's a big question. Is how you rate your friends, your kids, your coworkers, the people you come, come, come in contact with, is how you feel about them, how you interact with them, is it, is it based on appearances or performances? It's a big question. The next one is, and I think this one is paramount for today's day and age especially because it's just such an onslaught of, of media and information that comes into our mind. Who are you following, admiring, and copying? Who are you following, admiring, and copying? I want you to really consider that. Now, the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so it's okay to kind of emulate others if they're emulating Christ. But anything aside from that, if you're a big T. Swift fan out here, you better ask yourself, who is she following? What is she modeling for all of y'all, right? Who are you following? Who are you emulating? Who are you tracking? Who are you trying to be like? Are they following Jesus? Are they trying to be like him? Because if that's the case, then that we're good. But if it's not, you're following the wrong person And you're going to bear the fruit of that in your life. And then you're going to hold others to that standard. So how much, number three, is how much of what you do say, how much of what you do say, post, and think about is praising yourself rather than praising God and honoring others? It's another big question as we look at a passage like this. Who do you tend to associate with, invite, and seek out? This is another big question, and maybe this is where it, it kind of hits the road for you. Am I only in circles of people who agree with me, who look like me, who are at the same kind of place in life as me? Uh, am, am I associating with people who aren't like me, who are different than me, who I can learn from, who I can care for, and maybe they can care for me? Am I, am I seeking out a mentor who I can learn from and follow? Am I being a mentor to someone else? It's those kind of questions we're talking about. 
Who do we tend to associate with, invite, and seek out? I talk with many people after they've been a follower of Jesus for some time. They don't even, you, some of us don't even have any non-believing friends. We're not even in, a, in any type of friend circles or groups where we can be a disciple maker the way God has called us to be or to be an influence for Jesus the way God's called us to be. It's real easy to love your neighbor as yourself when you've surrounded yourself with people who are easy to love. Did you catch that one, church? It's easy to love your neighbor as yourself when you've surrounded yourself with people who are easy to love. Surround yourself with people who are hard to love, and then you'll really see how much you need the fruit of the Holy Spirit inside of you in order to love that person. Last one is this. What shift needs to happen to align you with the Word of God? You see, too often we're trying to read into the Word of God. We're trying to figure out where we line up. We're trying to skip the verses where our life doesn't line up. Where do we need to make some corrections in our life to align our life with what the Word of God has to say? Because that's what God's called us to. He's, he's not trying to have us justify the Word of God in, in our life or pick and choose or treat the Bible like some menu at a restaurant. He says, here's the whole Word of God, and as you read it and learn it, through the power of the Holy Spirit and fellowship, I want to transform your life and your mind into being more like me. That's what the Word of God is there for. And so today we're talking about showing favoritism and, and not showing favoritism, but walking in the favor or the grace of God. And so where is it in your life that we need to find a course correction on that? It might be how you feel about a group of people. It might be a specific person or situation. Uh, there could be a lot of things and areas in our lives that aren't in alignment with God. You know what that is, uh, but we need to bring it before God. God's favor eliminates favoritism. I want you to think about what the scripture says in, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It says, for it is by grace that you have been saved. The word grace means unmerited favor. It means that we got something that we don't deserve, okay? We didn't deserve for Jesus to come and die on the cross for our sins, but he did it. Why? Because he loves all of us. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For all of you here, you're hearing about favoritism and favor and all these kind of things. You're like, hey, that sounds really good, but you may not still be actually walking in the favor of God because you haven't grabbed a hold of the truth of this particular message. You see, when we think about life, when we think about what social media even highlights, we think about us praising ourselves, we've based life on merit, haven't we? We've based life on how well we do. We, we walk through life thinking, oh, well, God's going to show his favor on me if I do enough. He's going to show me the favoritism I want if I'm good enough, if I try enough, if I'm religious enough, if I pray enough, if I say the right prayer as opposed to the wrong prayer. We get into all of these things, and so we're working on this merit system, and then we transfer that to the world around us on the same merit system. Let me just say this, thank God that he doesn't do that. Because if I was working on a merit system before God, I would fail every time. Every time. Let's put that verse back up. For it is by grace that we've been saved. Unmerited. That's opposite. That's an upside down idea according to the world that we live in. There's no merit needed. There's no merit that will actually receive the grace of God. He gave it to us. It's unmerited favor. There's no favoritism. Uh, we've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can post it on social media and hope for enough likes because they did a good deed today. Oh, that's not what it says. Not by works, so that no one can boast. In verse 10, I don't have it up there, but it says we've been saved to do good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. And so here's what I have for you today when we consider where we're at on walking in God's grace, I know there's many of us in the room that have yet to say yes to Jesus. There's, there's probably a good handful here who have maybe been interested in the things of the Lord. You've been coming to church. You've been maybe even applying some of the Word of God, and you're starting to see some change, but there's just something missing. You haven't felt that full presence of the Holy Spirit. You haven't asked for forgiveness of your sins. You haven't declared Him as Lord I'm going to give you an opportunity today at the end of the service to say yes to Jesus today, to, to live out this verse, this Ephesians uh, 2, 8 and 9 verse here today, fully and holy, to say, yes, God, I believe that you sent Jesus to live a perfect life that I couldn't do. 
I believe that you sent him to die on the cross for my sacrifice and my sins, that you gave me something I don't deserve, and that's forgiveness. And I believe that you raised him from the dead, giving me eternal life. I believe all of those things. And at the end of the service, we're going to go through that again. And then it's for you to say, I believe it. God, forgive me of my sins. I want to, I want to follow you as Lord of my life. I want to turn and I want to walk in your favor. And I want to grow in that grace and in showing that grace to others. I'm going to give you an opportunity after we do some baptisms here today for you to do that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time, God, to hear your word, Lord. We're not finished yet. We're going to move to a new moment where we're celebrating your grace, where we're celebrating the fact that you've placed your favor on all people who are willing to receive your salvation. God, we thank you, God, that you are not a God who works on favoritism or a merit system, but you love freely and wholly, that you hold it out to us as a gift to receive if we choose to do so. God, we thank you for that. God, I pray for each one of us here. I, I know with my, with my whole heart uh, that you're raising up a generation of believers here at Christ Community Church, that we are seeking out people who are far from you, who are struggling in life, Lord. I, I know that, Lord, and I'm, I'm thankful for that, God. But I also know, Lord, that we still can get caught up in our own head, our own pride, Lord, of, of showing either ourselves praise and honor that's only due to you or honor we should be given to others, God. Help us in this way, Lord, to live out your word. Help us to love our neighbors as we, as we would want them to love us, as we would love our neighbors as even uh, above ourselves, God. Help us to be those people that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Well, we are going to do some more baptisms this week. I'm so, so excited. This is our third week of baptisms. We had a week at North. We can clap. And so if I could just have the four of you stand and turn and face the congregation. We started this last week. This is what we're doing from now on now. And so this is one of our favorite things to do. Baptisms and dedicating babies, I think, is, is the highlight uh, of all of this. But the reason why it's our favorite part is, is that each of these candidates has declared Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That verse in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that you just saw, they've received the grace of God. They've, they've prayed that prayer to say yes to Jesus. Some of them came forward to do it. Others have done it at other times. And we're going to invite you to come forward later. Uh, but God has changed their life, changed their life story. Can you turn around so they can read your shirt? It says, Jesus changed my life story. That's the shirt that they're wearing. And all their stories are different. Some have some real difficulties in them. Some were just kind of walking through life apart from God. Uh, every story of every person being baptized has a different past, but it has the same moment where it converged, and that's the day that they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then they entered into the family of believers right here with us and the rest of the world, those who have gone ahead and those to come. Uh, they've entered into that. Their story has been changed through the power of Christ Jesus' blood. Amen? Amen? Amen. In a minute, they're going to enter the waters. The waters don't save anybody. It's just taunting water. They're gonna, it's hopefully not as hot as it was last week. It was very warm. But either way, uh, they're going to go under the water, and that signifies them being buried in the likeness of Jesus' death, that their old self died when Christ died on the cross, when they said yes to him, and their new self is being raised to life like his resurrection. It signifies that eternal life. They've already received the Holy Spirit the day that they accepted him as Lord and Savior. That was the new starting place. Today is not the finish line. It's another starting line. Uh, but, but Scripture tells us that once we repent and declare him as Savior, that we're to be baptized. And so they're following through on what God's Word says. So when they've repented from following their ways, and now we're following Jesus' ways, we have a public moment to declare outwardly what they've already made as a decision inwardly. So let me pray for you guys, and then we're going to do some baptizing. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing group of people, God. I thank you, God, that you have changed their life story. I thank you, God, that they now proclaim you as Lord and Savior. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making your dwelling place in them. Thank you for the beginning, the great work, Lord, in them, of healing them and, and transforming them into this new creature in you, Jesus. 
God, I pray for spiritual protection over them in the days and the weeks and the years to come, Lord. Lord, we know that the enemy wants nothing more to thwart them, distract them, keep them from fulfilling their true purpose in you. Holy Spirit, I pray for a covering over them in that area, Lord. God, I pray that they would spend the rest of their lives discovering the good works that you've prepared for them in advance to do, all for your glory and honor and praise and not their own, God. I thank you, Lord, for friends and family who have come out today to witness this moment where they declare publicly the inward faith that they've put in you as Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. We pray your great blessing on them now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that the service today connected with you and helped you grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you have any prayer needs or simply would like somebody to reach out or come alongside you in your faith journey, please let us know by filling out our online connect card or simply emailing us at Christcommunity at cccfamily.com. If this online service has blessed you in any way and you feel led to support the ministry at Christ Community Church financially, please visit our website and consider donating so we can continue to make as many resources available as possible to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless.